uh, you can afford to be an atheist when, when you're healthy. <laughs> uh, but he's going to say something. We're going to play a little video to cue tonight up for where Barry McGuire and I are going to go. Because it's very, very telling. So listen carefully. We'll have, please have the volume up, guys. Uh, and listen to how he's approached the spirit, the attitude in which he was approached, what, what he was in, uh, encouraged to do. He's going to be... He, He's going to tell you that he was given a Bible. Listen to, to his attitude as an atheist regarding the winsomeness of whoever this person was who gave him the Bible. Because so many of us think that when we witness for Jesus that we've got to talk to somebody and get them to the sinner's prayer and if there was water nearby, baptize them at the same time, <laughs> maybe throw down some communion elements and then, you know, we're, we're good. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. But let's start tonight by hearing an atheist give us a report on how winsome a Christian was in his life not too long ago. I want to talk to you about this. Uh, I get home from the show, and at the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we uh, we talk to folks, and you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side in the um, what I call the hover position after I was all done. Big guy, probably about my age. Big guy, and. Um, he had been the, um, the guy who has uh, picks the joke during our psychic comedian section of the show. Uh, so he had the props from that in his hand because we'd give those away. He had the, you know, the joke book and the, and the envelope and the paper and stuff. If you haven't seen the live show, I, uh, it's not worth explaining. But he had props from the show that we'd given him from the night before. Uh, he wasn't the guy that night. And he walked over to me and he said... Um, I was here last night at the show, and uh, uh, I saw the show and I liked it. I wanted, and he was very complimentary about my use of language and um, complimentary about, you know, honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. No reason to go into it. He said nice stuff. And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a uh, Gideon pocket edition um, I thought I said from the New Testament, but I also thought it was Psalms from the New Testament, right? Or, uh, Psalms from the New, just part of the New Testament. A little <laughs> book about this big, this thick, you know. He said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of uh, proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm, I'm sane, I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this. And uh, it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. Hmm. But he was not uh, defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not, getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that uh, 
well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? Wow. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought that, and I've written about that, and I've thought of it conceptually. But this guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a, a Bible, which had written in it a little note to me, uh, not very personal, but just, you know, like your show and so on. And then like five phone numbers for him and an email address <laughs> if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. Uh, but I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And uh, that's really important. And with that kind of goodness, uh, it's okay to have that deep of a disagreement. I still think that religion does a lot of bad stuff, but man, that was a good man who gave you that book. That's all I wanted to say. So, did you hear him, obviously? So here's an atheist who says, I know there's no God, but we actually know from the Bible that he doesn't know that. He's terrified. He's hoping that there is no God. But the amazing thing is, this man was just giving kudos and appreciation to someone who cared enough about Penn Gillette's soul to risk embarrassment or whatever it is to share with him. And that caused so much respect in this atheist heart that if people really believed the Bible, then they would have to believe that there is a heaven and that there is a hell and both are real and one is no less or no real than the other they are. They exist. And this atheist has enough sense to say, man, if it was true, you got to tell people. And you've got to wonder in this age of ours how few Christians believe that there is an actual hell. Because very few people care about telling others about the love of God and the forgiveness of God and the gospel of God through Jesus Christ for fear that they might look silly or be embarrassed. And that is a dynamic that we're going to address tonight. It's, it's going to be a powerful night. This guy needs no introduction. Uh, Barry McGuire is the the car guy, he is the McGuire Wax, Car Wax Corporation, global. He is the Ignite Your Life voice of reaching people around the world with the gospel. He happens to have a global business, but it is a pulpit that he and his wife, Karen, dedicated to the Lord decades, decades ago. And he is a remarkable man of God. And listen, uh, he's in his 80s, and I cannot keep up with him. <laughs> and so for the rest of you, uh, we have no excuse. The key to his success in every way is that Jesus Christ is first. So can you give a warm welcome to Barry McGuire? Isn't that a video amazing? It is. I mean, what did that take? It took love. It was just a simple man provoked by God, and he just loved on him. He didn't have a script. He didn't have any cliches. Anything. He just loved on him. 
it's hard it's it's hard to resist love jesus said they'll know you're my my disciple by your love and not by reciting a bunch of stuff and all the stuff that gets hard and deliberate and and plastic and, and salesmanship why is it just loving on people and when you love on people you just allow the conversation to go and you let them take the lead and you love them back and you're just amazed how fast conversations open up people need love nobody's getting any love and and and, and really the, the further away they are from you the, the more unlike they are from you i i just love going to go that don't look like me it's so it just interrupts them <laughs> they're just like what and I'm loving on them. I'm, I'm, I may be the people group that they hate the most. <laughs> and I'm telling you about God, it just interrupts it. It's fun. I got to tell you, what we're talking about tonight is the most fun you could possibly have, and you can have it every day. It's so great to be here. We've been laughing we, the last three hours together. Been, lo- yeah, longer than that, actually. <laughs> Listen to this, and then I'm going to, because of what you just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you up for the uh, Alabama man. How about that? Oh, okay. Okay, okay so listen sure. to this. First Peter... 3, 15, but sanctify, this is key, so set God apart in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks of you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and with respect. So as a believer, you are holding the, the treasure of Almighty God, the gospel. Do, do you know the gospel, for example? And as a Christian, as a believer, that us having that, we have eternal life. We've come to Christ, we have eternal life. And one of the things that causes you and I to respond to others who are not even people, as Barry said a moment ago, they're not necessarily the kind of people we would normally speak with or hang out with. That God prompts your heart to speak to them in some way, shape, or form. And this is not for the evangelist. This is not for the Billy Graham types or the street evangelist. This is for every one of us as believers. Your greatest mission in life, think about it, is to get others into the kingdom of heaven. Of course, start with your family first, right? Your kids and your grandkids first, your husband and your wife first. But outside of that, to love like God is to love others into the kingdom of God. And there are many forms of evangelism and personal evangelism, but... None of them will work unless someone is convinced that you love them. And church family, we're here to tell you tonight, and Barry's going to, I'm going to put him on the spot right now about the Alabama man. People, when people, people can find out in, in a matter of minutes if you are sincerely caring for their soul. And so this night is going to be dedicated, and it's an unusual happening now, but this is part two of what we did some time ago, and it had such huge media success, it affected so many people. I was in Arlington, Texas, very recently, and, um, and I had people coming up to me telling me how this, the first night that Barry and I sat together, how much it affected them. And they started doing uh, what we talked about that night, and now this is gonna be part two. But I, I, people need to hear up front now, and it's going to help them the rest of the evening. Tell us about the Alabama man. <laughs> we, have, we have many stories um, that we'll get some more in tonight. We heard a lot from you over the last several months. So give us some how-tos. You tell us what to do, but the how, how do we actually make it fun? And what does it do for you personally? So... Um, there's a, a, a famous pitcher who lost his right arm, played for the Giants, Dave DeVecchi. And I was at a meeting with Dave, and we hit it off, and he had a mutual friend that was a mutual friend of mine. I said, I would like to have lunch with Dave DeVecchi. And I'm in Scottsdale, and Dave DeVecchi's in Chandler. It's about a 40-minute drive. And so they picked out a barbecue. They don't like barbecue. So we went to a restaurant I'd never been to, about 40-minute drive. And Dave couldn't meet us till 1.30, so the parking lot was completely empty, except for about six cars, okay? So my friend Jay drives in, and he comes around. He could have parked anywhere. The, the, the restaurant's here. Here's this huge parking lot. Could have hundreds of cars. There's like maybe six cars. And he pulls up nonchalantly and just pulls right up 
uh, to, to the nose of another car. <laughs> and it's an old oxidized car with the hood up. And when I looked up, I saw a, a guy with dreadlocks and, and a, a tank top and, and, and tattoos all over himself, as you would say, you know, and it's like not necessarily somebody that you'd think you just run to. And yet I do. Every time you just look for opportunities, any chance, any chance of anybody's in need to run to them, you have no idea where it takes you. You have no what kind of adventure you're going to be on. It makes every day an adventure. So I get out, I go right over to him, and Karen laughs at me because I said, well, do you need any help? Like I could actually help him with his car, you know. <laughs> and he was, he was carrying one of these big old sparklings bottles. You know the big kind that goes on top of the cooler, the great big round one? Well, he was coming up from behind his car with this, and it had water in it. And I said, hi, sir, can I help you? He said, no, no, thank you very much, but I, I, just, uh, I just got here from Alabama just this moment, and um, I have a leaky radiator. So I got this big bottle of water to last me, and it lasted me. Look, I still have water left to put it in after I got it. It's really cool. I said, what brought you from Alabama? He said, well, um, there's no work in Alabama, and I have a, a wife and a son there, and I have a friend out here who said to get me a job. I said, really? He, I said, what, what would be the job? He said, going to get me to, to drive a truck. I said, you ever drive a truck before? He said, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little complicated if you're going to drive a truck, but I don't know if he figured that out. But I said, have you ever driven a truck before? No. Nope. I said, you're a little worried about that. He said, uh, you think? And I said, uh, but you always, you just let the Holy Spirit give you the words to say. And right on cue, it may be something you already know, but he brings it to mind, so it's just, it yes. works perfect. So I said, you know, when I, he was about 25 years of age. I said, when I was your age, um, I started a, a retail car wax company. We had no money. Nobody knew who we were. And I discovered this scripture that says, trust the Lord with your whole heart. Don't depend on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. And he did. And he looked at me like he'd never heard that before. He said, are you telling me that you just asked God, and he directed your steps like he could direct mine? I said, absolutely. That's what he wants to do for you. Well, now he's really excited. I said, but, you know, you need a, a personal relationship with God, and he loves you. And, and, and by the way, and I pulled out, I hope I have one. <laughs> what, a Seeking God card? I should have a Seeking God card. Yeah. So I pulled out one of our Seeking God cards, and I said, we just have a moment here. But if you go to this website, these are all available to you. You know that? Uh, you pull out that website with a QR code. It'll tell you how much God loves you and how he has a plan for your life. And he wants you to spend eternity with the heaven. And he took that card like it was gold. Mm. He looked at it. He said, I can get all that off of here? I said, yeah. <laughs> he says, thank you. I said, you're, you're really welcome. I said, can I pray for you? He said, would you? And so I grabbed him and I prayed for this young man. <laughs> and it was a Holy Ghost prayer. I mean, there was, God was just in it. And we, when we broke, he, he was crying. He said, thank you for caring for me. It took seven minutes, folks. Seven minutes. Think about this. He directs our steps. He directed me to a restaurant I've never been to before. 35, 40 minutes from my house. He directed him from Alabama. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How long did that take in this beat up old car? <laughs> Days, all the heat, all the... To pull him up right in the water bottle. In the bottle. I mean, you know, and, and he pulled him up. And, da and Jay, my friend Jay Snyder, just, he just meandered around and just happened to pull up. You think that wasn't God directed? That's God directed. What does that do for my faith? Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> yep. Man. Yep. And that's why he does it. Isaiah 43 10 says, I appoint you as my witness so that you will believe. In most places, most Christians are living in fear. Even in a church as healthy as this, you don't get more healthy than this. But all these things that bother you, if you have fear, you don't have faith. And you can't preach God without faith. So you want to defeat fear. When you do this, when you get off the bench and into the game, let me tell you, you don't have any fear anymore. Your faith is exploding. <laughs> You're in the game. And that's yeah. what this is really all about. <laughs> so you guys... Um, Somebody might say, because you guys asked, what are, what are some do's? Give us some do's and don'ts, and, and, and we want to hear from Barry about, about what do we do next. And so as we go on tonight, 
Uh, he's been hard at work putting together some things that you're going to hear about tonight that are awesome as a result of our last time together. But we're talking about sharing your faith. And so the, the very key thing is, is, is not to assume uh, that you, you've got something to say. You want to know this. So the number one thing is you can't give anything away that you don't have. So we ourselves must realize, do we have the gospel? Are we born again? Are we trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for having died on the cross for our sins and risen from the dead to justify us? Is it all, is it all of God? And if you have become a child of the living God, then the very next thing for you to do for the rest of your life is to share that great discovery with other people. And one of the things that we get bogged down in is we think that it's, it's too hard, it's too difficult. And I think, that's, I think Satan is in that, to really try to make it, oh, that, that's got to be for other people and other personalities. Hmm. No, look, can you imagine the gospel being limited for those who have certain personalities <laughs> to be shared via or through? There's no way. It's for all of us. The scripture tells us to, to, to do the work of an evangelist. So church family... Um, Somebody might say today, well, uh, when, you, when you meet somebody, you should give them the four spiritual laws and, and close the deal. Well, who says this? Maybe that would work. Maybe God would lead you, but God will move in a life through you to reach another person in ma- many various ways. And one of the most powerful ways is what Barry's talking about is you... And I, us, looking around, that means, look, paying attention to the environment that we're in, law enforcement, military, we'd call it situational awareness. I'm at DMV, I'm at the grocery store, I'm at the game, and you're looking for someone that God might prompt your heart to speak to. And you simply, you don't go up there and say, you know, you need to accept Christ or you're going to burn in hell forever and it's all going to come to an end and you've got seconds to do this. You don't do that. There's ways to approach people that tell them that you care. And Barry has told me some other things in in Hollywood and stuff where there was some famous uh, music rapper uh, sitting down for lunch. Different, listen, different skin color, different size, different age, different worlds. And Barry got up from his seat and went over and showed the guy some kindness. Church family, we must, as Barry puts it, it's iconic now, is just move people closer to Jesus. Show them the love of God. Show them that you care. And so Ignite Your Life is devoted. Move everyone, everyone. A lot of programs say find somebody today to share your faith with. Be watching for them. Well, out of all the people we're going to be with today or going to hell, how do we pick one? How do you pick the right one? So the fact of the matter is, wherever we are, we're surrounded by about 90% of the people that are going to hell. We don't like to talk about that, but they're going to hell. Yeah, listen to what Ben Gillette said. Do we understand what's going on around us? So if we do, we we want to reach everybody. So... You reach everybody, everybody you possibly can. You just touch them. And in a moment, you can just, God bless you and have a good day. In a moment, you can do something. Say, that was a nice person and that was a Christian. But this thing of uh, trying to conjure up and have, have the feeling of I got to memorize this stuff and thank God for all the programs that have done that. A lot of millions of people would run to the Lord by those. Thank you for them. Yes. But the fact of the matter is probably 99% of us here have not gone to a class. And then we use it as an excuse <laughs> not to share our faith. Mm. But the most prolific faith shares are new Christians. That's right. And, and they don't know one scripture. They don't even know what theology is. <laughs> right? They have zeal. They have, they have love. That's, that's all you need. So there's a couple of scriptures that give us some really good advice. Mike, Mark 13, 11 says, don't prepare. Look it up. Mark 13, 11 says, don't prepare for your defense. Quite frankly, you can't. You have no idea. You're moving from person to person to person during the day, and you have no idea what the problem is. How could you possibly prepare? And then when you run out of words to say, Luke 12, 12 says the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. That's right. When you need them. That's when it's cool. See, if we do it on our own strength, 
in our own memorization, we can walk away feeling pretty good. I pulled that off. Mm. I, I, I pulled it. I, I memorized all those lines. <laughs> I recited it just perfectly. As opposed to allowing God to do it, you realize that was God, and the glory goes to him, and you look up and you say, God, you just used me. I often, I told you before, I have to look up, I see Jesus looking down at me, happy with me. We can give him joy. Do you know we can give God joy? We can give him joy. And I, the, the joy of the Lord is our strength, but we know that we're exactly where we're supposed to be, and God just used us to change the life in front of us. I got to tell you, if you haven't had that experience, <laughs> and you can have it every day, it's so much fun. So we have to get off the precipice that it's all this... Uh, angst and all the in their face and I'm going to get per- we've never been persecuted Karen and I never been 50 years never, not once it's probably he, coming don't worry it, it, well it, 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 in you know, this world persecution is horrible around the world but it's not here yet it may come yeah but right now it's not here and particularly when you tell people God loves them mm. it's hard for people to get mad at you when you say do you know God loves you and, and they just they just they can't can't handle it yeah. They, 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 they can't process it. They can't, he can't, they're thinking, after all I've done, he can't possibly love me. And, and when you get that across to them, they're not fighting you. It just, it just opens them up. It's a, it's a beautiful thing to realize that when we read the scriptures, we see uh, what the Europeans call friendship evangelism. Now, apart from uh, the likes of Billy Graham, where Billy Graham... Uh, did do at least one, maybe more, of uh, crusades in Europe. Uh, crusades don't work in the Middle East. They don't work in, in Europe. Uh, the European model, uh, they'll tell you, is that sharing the Lord is friendship evangelism. And we as Westerners, uh, at least in America, I should say, um, we're impatient with that. So, for example, friendship evangelism, and I'm, I'm kind of taking, not kind of, I'm taking this almost verbatim from Dr. A.E. Wilder-Smith, who we had speak at this church uh, before he passed, and uh, we had the honor of having him, if you don't know who he is, it doesn't matter, but he's in heaven now, but uh, from Einigen, Switzerland, and he, he was talking about evangelism, and that, that they share Christ on a consistent basis with those whom they work with by how they work at their jobs their 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 motivation their their response their attitude their demeanor their we call it witness and i think sometimes we've gotten the demand of i gotta go tell somebody about jesus because you know we've heard people say you know i've told somebody about jesus every day of my life then we think well i gotta go out and tell somebody about jesus but even in doing that, that's not the right motive to go do it. That's just another notch in your belt. Are you hearing me? It's got to be organic, and it, and it has to be out of love. And Dr. Wilder Smith said that once you've earned someone or gained someone's trust, then you can bring up, or you've earned the opportunity yeah. to bring up the gospel to them. You say, I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Yes, you have. When you read your Bible... That's very much like what it was in the first century church. There were a few exceptions where there was a crowd. Peter, for example, on, this, on the uh, southern steps there in Jerusalem. But many times you're reading about Jesus or Paul discussing, talking, asking, and relating to people. And this is something that we would love to see happen more and more, uh, not only in this church, but in every church in America, where people just determine, I'm going to love on that person. And how many of you have been a Christian for over 10 years? Anybody over 10 years? Wow. So, wow, well, that, that is a lot of you. <laughs> like... So you guys have learned by now that the person that uh, hate, hates you the most or hated you the most, the person that's the most offensive at work or the most difficult relative, by now, after being a Christian for 10 years, you've discovered that by targeting them in prayer and loving on them deliberately has caused a lot of walls to come down. Maybe not fully, but the game is not over yet if they're still living. You've been sowing seed. Can we sow seeds of love among people rather than pass them by is what we want to make sure that you understand when it comes to this late hour 
of the church age, every single one of us need to be telling others about the love of God and that Jesus went to the cross for them. And you can get to that. You can get to all of the theology that we're supposed to get to. Repentance from sin, all of that. But listen, no one's going to listen to you. And I'll, I'll be quiet in a moment. No one's going to listen to you <laughs> if they don't think you care. And you know what, I'm, what I mean by this. You have been places where there's guys carrying banners with megaphones, preaching. They're actually saying all, they're saying the verses. And I can't hear, I can't stomach, isn't that sad? I can't stomach any of what they're saying. They're saying, the, they're quoting the truth, but they've wrapped it in a, con, a condescending, sour demeanor where I know that there's no love relationship, there's no experience here. Do they really care for my soul or are they putting a notch in their evangelistic belt? Barry. Yeah. I'm thinking of a book written by Dr. Jerry Root, uh, The Sacrament of Evangelism. And, and there was a time when I would be <laughs> in a face-sharing opportunity and I'd be saying, God, I, come, I got a live one. <laughs> Can you come over here and help me? <laughs> and that's absurd, of course. He's already working with everybody before we get to them. And he explains eloquently, I'm just touching the high points, but that when we join in with anybody, when we're sharing with them, we're coming into fellowship there. It's a sacrament. It's a sacred time. Mm. And the Holy Spirit's already working. And quite frankly, I don't, I don't engage people to get them saved. And that is my end game. I engage them to engage them. If, if, they, if you have another goal, they can sense that. But the Holy Spirit will give witness to them, this is real love. Most people don't have anybody that loves them. Not one. Most people do not have one person that loves them. And when you, you express love to them, it's so quickly that they respond. And it's a spirit. It's not just us. It's not just two people. It's a divine, holy experience. And God confirms in their heart. And then it just starts opening up. And you, and, and you start in the, in the simplest of ways. You know, oh, I love that hat. Or I love that dress. Or you're wearing a cross. Or, or what a beautiful family. Or I walk through. It's, that's like, it's, it sounds a little silly maybe, but kind of being like a Pied Piper that you're just distributing love. Everybody, just look. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't want to sound like it's just crazy, but when you walk, just be, be looking at people. Have a smile on your face. Christian, you can walk around dour like the end of the world. Make yourself approachable. And then when you make eye contact, say something to them mm. and give them a compliment. And most of the time, it's fine. Hi, God bless you. Just have a good day. But then there's those moments throughout the day where they want more, and you engage in conversation, and then there'll be the ones where they, where they really pursue you, and you'll have those every day. It's, just, it's so much fun, but just love on them. It's not hard. To, you know, there's no rules. <laughs> love on them. There's a million ways to love on them. I'll see a, a family in a restaurant. I'm walking through, and there's a family of color there, and they're all dressed nicely. And I stop, and I say, oh. I just like to take a picture of you guys. You guys, you're the American family. This is what America's all about. It's, 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 Mom and Dad doing great. And kids, when you pray tonight, I, I would encourage you to thank God every time you pray at night. Thank them for giving you parents that love on you. Do you know how most kids don't have parents like this, and you do? And they're like, yeah. And the parents <laughs> are like, yeah. <laughs> you just it, it takes two minutes. Two minutes. But you got to be thinking about it. Encourage them. Think they might have that discussion going home? Dad, should we be praying every night? <laughs> there's, a, there's a million ways to do it. The point is love on it, move everybody every day closer to Jesus. And as you do that throughout the course of every day, you're going to be surprised with conversations that will just blow you away. Because so many people are hurting and wanting love, and they want to know more. And let them pursue you. You don't go after them. You let them pursue you. You just, I caught throwing out chum. You just, like, <laughs> deep sea fishing, you know. And then they start coming up that chum line, and there's nothing more exciting than seeing a, a, somebody that doesn't know the Lord coming up, taking a bite, and wanting to know more and more and more. That's, that's great fun. That's exactly right. So why, why would we hesitate in sharing, like, what 
Barry just said, for, for example. Why, why would we, if we saw that beautiful black family all dressed up in that Sunday afternoon or whatever when it was, and they're eating, and it's, and it's that slice of, of family, and like you said, America, and there's hope, and there's a beautiful, it's, it's the, the, the Norman Rockwell moment. Absolutely. Or whatever it m- might be. You, yes. it, it, you may not yeah. see the Norman Rockwell moment. It could be somebody that is hurting on the side of the road. But for us to stop and say something that's appropriate to that situation. You guys, every single one of us have that encounter at least once a day somewhere, somehow. And if we would begin to say things like what Barry's saying... And again, we think you should have those cards in your pocket. There's a lot of great information on there. But if, even if you don't, it's not predicated upon you having uh, the Seeking God card. But for you just to say to them, I think that, uh, I think that you look, I, I may be prying, I don't mean to. I, you look sad, are you okay? Is there anything I can help you with? That person may not have had someone ask them anything like that deep in that a long happens. time. That happens all the time. And who There's refuses people you? People in distress you around us all the time and they need some help. But I, I'm a little busy. I, I don't have time to stop. You follow the nudge. Every time you follow that nudge and you live in the fog, you live in the favor of God. You'll be blessed every time you stop and take the time. I don't know what I'm going to say. I have no idea. Where, I was talking to somebody yesterday. They had a friend in such turmoil. It was just bizarre. I said, uh, can I talk to him? Yeah. I have no idea what I'm going to say to him. You know, I don't, but God will give me the words. Let me talk to him. I can't That's wait. Right. But that, there's no pressure. It's just, it's just so easy. It, it's, it's, there's no reason to not do it. There because just are, aren't we talking about just caring for other people? Just caring for other people. Really? The end result, we know where that's going, but don't press on that. It's just love on them and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. And he does. He does. And while you're, he's speaking through you, he's speaking through that person. He's bringing you together. It's just, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> so Barry, I want to talk about some of the things that, that are going on now since your first time here. Uh, so example, can you talk about, um, and the book is out and it's having a run, it's going for it, but you've started Ignite Your Life Bible Study. You've got nine sessions uh, that are going on. Can you now describe what's gone on since our last meeting? And there's a list of things. I've got like nine or eight things right here. What has happened since? Well, our, our ministry has been growing for a long time. We've been doing it for a few years, but it's reaching critical mass at this point. And there are things that were already going that we didn't talk about last time. And then because of last time, we started brainstorming some things we can go further. But most of all, uh, those of you who read the book are... Uh, the most common phrase we hear is, that book changed my life. <laughs> I, I never knew how easy it was, how fun it was to share my faith. It's like, it's like they have a new toy. <laughs> uh, I talked to, to a precious lady down here two Sundays ago. She's 85 years old. And she said, I didn't accept the Lord until I was 75. Wow. She broke all the odds. She says, but I, I was saved, but then I read your book. Now I'm a faith-sharing machine. <laughs> <laughs> and she started telling me all the stories. People line up, they talk to me on Sunday mornings, they all want to tell me their stories. But people wanting to know more, how, how, how do I do that? I need to know more. They want more. The book was a good starter. So now we have a nine-lesson Bible study. Go to our website. It's there. And I think we have a screen up here how you get to go to igniteamerica.com. I'll have the whole word of study. It's free. It's downloadable. It's 50 pages of information and, and videos. You cannot believe how robust. This is a major uh, achievement for us to, to excite you. I got to tell you, if, if you'll get through, if it's, it's not an easy study. <laughs> this is not just have a good day kind of thing. It's, just, it's, it's in your face, but every time you say, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. By the time you get the ninth one, ninth study, they're all about an hour in length. And I actually lead it myself, and then we break it. I, I throw a comment, and there's discussion. So there's discussion periods through it. Each one is fun, 
but I got to, each one's in your face. And when you, I guarantee you get through all nine sessions, <laughs> you're going to be a face sharing machine. You're, you're going to be there. So it's, we're pretty excited about this, this Bible study. Uh, you can study on your own. Or you can have it as a group said, you can do it either way. But anyway, it's great fun. Now tell us about this great idea. Um, and I want, I want all of you to get in on this. This is awesome. But were you uh, online, I guess? You, you have a group or you're going to have a group where anyone can join and you're sharing. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. And you, mm-hmm. you encourage people to leave their, their testimony, their experience yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. at your site and people can... <laughs> Explain well, uh, to go back for a moment, uh, most people are worried about what's going on in this world, and they're really fretting over it. But the fact of the matter is you can't do anything about the world. If you're carrying the weight of this world around, what's going to happen next, and, you know, Newsom or Biden or whatever, the weight that people are carrying around with you, you can't do anything about that. What are you worrying about? You can't change that anyway. You, worrying about the world is worthless. Worrying about your world Let's bring it down to the word you impact. You have influence. Every one of you have influence. Mm-hmm. That's your world. And your role is to ignite your world, okay, doing what we're talking about here. But the great thing is just like on Sunday mornings when, when people come up to me and they're telling me their stories, you have a face sharing story, even you can't believe it. You can't wait to tell somebody, you can't believe what just happened here. I mean, just, and the moment you're at the peak of that is when it just happened. And so now you, you just dial up... Um, igniteyourworld.com and and go to that site and you can type it or you can put it in by video and you can tell your story exciting about right way so you captured it but not just for yourself for the world and we're going to build a community of people not just christians what's a community of christians they're all over the place you don't know if they're christian or not everybody says they're christian Faith sharing Christians are a whole other thing. When you're talking about first love Christians, it is bringing first love Christians together. And all of a sudden, I see here's a car guy in Georgia that's sharing his faith. What am I going to do? Well, I can post to him publicly and say, Praise God, thank you for your testimony. Or I can do it privately. And I can do a private post to that person and connect with them and say, Hey, this is Barry McGuire. I'm a car guy too. We need to talk. And you start building, you hear what I'm talking about here? You start building community with faith sharing Christians that are very much like yourselves all over. We're going to start something here that's going to be pretty interesting. We've just launched it. We've got a few people on already, but give us another month or two. This, thing's, this thing has a lot of legs. We're really excited about that because <laughs> when testimony, uh, which uh, it's, it's kind of sad in our culture in this day and age, I, I say in church culture, is uh, testimony is not shared enough. Um, that's why smaller groups are very, very important. Uh, it, gosh, I want to be to the point, but I don't want to discourage anybody or offend anybody. I, bottom line is this, that Sunday morning church is supposed to be the cherry on top of your experience of the week. Okay, so, well then, if, if Sunday morning is just the cherry, then, then what's, what's the, 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 where's the hot fudge? Where's the ice cream? Where's the, <laughs> that's the rest of the week as a believer. And you say, well, who's, who can do that? I've got, I've got these other things going on. Exactly. And this is where this hits hard right now, is if there was ever a time that would apply or the term would apply, you've heard this, why are you arranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic <laughs> while it's sinking? The, the world is in a free fall. And the most important thing that you can do right now is, yes, have your water heater tied down in case of an earthquake. Everybody should have that. You should have some drinking water, some food to eat. Your family should be safe. And you should be telling people about Jesus. Why? Because we don't know how long we're going to live. We don't know how long they're going to live. But Sunday mornings is where you get re-equipped and re-energized and you come together in what's called technically and traditionally a convocation. The gathering together of the saints but then you go out into the world and you do Christianity in your home and everywhere else. 
And we in the West have been terribly distracted by things. Let's be honest, we all, we're all doing this, and it it's might be golf, or it might be softball, soccer, it's kids' commitments to this, that, and the other thing. I'm not knocking it, except that it, it would not be a good idea to have your kid be the best soccer player and not know Jesus. <laughs> Think about that. It comes down to priority. If we sense that there's an urgency in the world in which we live in, and I think you do, then we want to tell others about Jesus. And then we get dry mouth and terrified. But if you can say to someone, hey, excuse me, but where, where did you get that shirt? Or where did you, can I ask you something? I have a jacket like that, but, but I know where I got mine. Where did you get yours? They'll say something. Just ask them something. Be honest. Anything, ask them. Anything. There's always, a re, always There's something always you can something. say about people. And then use that yeah. to, at the very least yeah. to say to them, um, you know, is there anything I can pray for you for? Uh, mm-hmm. But that may come way later. That may come. Yeah. It may not even happen in that conversation. You, you just never know. It may, it may happen. But the, uh, the, the, the point of it is just... You love on everybody. I mean, you just keep doing it, everybody. And it, 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 the, the odds are it's going to come up on the right side so often it just blows you away. I am. Um, really yesterday I was talking to a San Bernardino County uh, Deputy Sheriff. And um, it's not that we had an appointment. We bumped into each other. And yeah. I told him, I, this is kind of what I, I have a little shtick when I meet police officers and I, I tell them, uh, hey, excuse me, one second. I just want you to know that I, my family, and the church that I attend tremendously appreciate your service and sacrifice to our community. You're prayed for, and always add this, and don't listen to CNN or MSNBC (laughs) because we do care and we do support you. And... And for me, I throw that out there to them, and you'll be surprised how many of them will say, well, what church do you go to? Because when I tell them, our church prays for our first responders. Well, what church do you go to? That's just opening that door a little bit. That communicates tremendous care. And that guy, we shook hands, and that guy walked away. I, I think he walked away with a little bit better opinion of Christians, maybe, right? I don't know. But it's not for me to conclude that. It's up to God to use it. But for us to start speaking up winsomely, I think Christians are too, we're too polite <laughs> and we're too quiet. Well, it's great fun. And you don't have to get dry mouth when you're loving on people. And you just do that. I mean, that's just obvious. But um, the, um, the, the peer pressure, I, it's better than peer pressure. What, what ignites people to share their faith more than anything else is listening to other people's stories about how they share their faith. And one of the great benefits, and I think we have a slide for this, igniteyourworld.com, where it'll tell you where to go to get it. There but the go. fact of the matter is, you have all the listings of all these, we, we, all, we all take these things when we have spare time, and we find something to look at, <laughs> because we got 15 minutes and we're going to use the phone, Right? Well, now you go to Ignite Your World, and you can see one miracle story after another, after another story, after another story, after another story. What's that going to do for you? When you hear these other stories, what will ignite you? It, it, there is a phenomenon. I've seen it in some people. Where they're sharing their faith like crazy, and then it's not mentioned, and they don't know anybody else is doing it, and it was good, but they're, we need reinforcement. This is reinforcement. Yeah. Ignite Your World is reinforced because it also tells you fresh ways other people are doing it and having success. So it'll stimulate you to be in the game every day, all day long, every day. And so it, it is, there's a bit of peer pressure in that, you might say. But it is so exciting to hear other people. It, it ignites me. When I come to church on Sunday, I hear the stories. I'm more ignited when I, <laughs> when I leave this church. So I'm going to ask Barry a question. But before I ask him, I'm going to ask you this question. Um, and we'll see how, how many honest people there are in the room. When, when you have had that nudge, Barry called it the nudge, I call it the, the, the tap or the pull, where you sense you're interrupted with a thought that you should approach that person. 
Um, how many of you get really nervous when, when that happens? Raise your hand. <laughs> why, why, I, my hand's up too. Why, why, why does that happen? Think about why. I'm going to go over there and introduce myself to an absolute stranger. I, I don't know them. They don't know me. Think about how silly it is for us to become apprehensive. You don't know them. It's not your boss. You don't work there. It's some person at, the, at Walmart. But we start to get nervous. Then, then I call, we say dry mouth. Start to, uh, what's happening? Barry, why is it that our initial response is often fear? That horrible <clears throat> thing of fear. And who's behind the fear? Well, it's the author of fear, Satan, of course. Uh, I, I, I have no doubt that the number one weapon Satan uses against Christians is fear. Yeah. Because he not only paralyzes us, he sterilizes us. Mm. If we're in fear, we're not in faith. If we're not in faith, we can't share our faith. That's right. So we have to change our mindset, folks. All you raise your hands and I understand that. I have not been there for several decades, but I understand. I remember when I was there. <laughs> But the fun of it is, this is the fun of it, you go with reckless abandon. You have no preparation. You just go, and you start loving on people, and God gives you words, and you do that several times, and all of a sudden you realize, this is fun. <laughs> it's just fun. And I've never struck out, never once. I mean, he always gives you the words. I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. And, and for the first time, and I say the only time in your, in your, in your life, can you be totally committed to God and open to God using you? You're his instrument out there with reckless abandon, just trusting him. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I'm going to love on these people. And watch what happens to your life and what happens to your faith. It's life-changing. It will, it will revolutionary. It, it'll, um, it'll ignite your life. <laughs> I mean, it really well. It's just amazing how that works. It, it's true. It absolutely works that way. So it's uh, it just, I know it's scary to think about it, and we've been trained that way. We've been trained that we're going to get persecuted. We're going to be trained that, we've been trained that all these tough questions, all that. Forget it. That's over. Get, get rid of that. I hope tonight maybe we have a joint prayer on that. We just get, throw oh. that away. It is, it is just living for God and, use, and allowing him to use you to be there and speak to you and change lives. And, and you're, when you get off the bench into the game, there's no more fear. There just isn't. I think uh, we were talking <laughs> earlier today that one of those trip hazards that we have is believing that we have to somehow be schooled in, a, in apologetics. No. That we've got no. to go to Azusa or Biola or Liberty sorry, to take a course no. on apologetics before <clears throat> we could share. Listen, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says to do the work of an evangelist. He didn't say go into the world, all you who have apologetics, or all you who can memorize scripture, or all you have a silver tongue, or, or, or none of those. He says, go ye. That's every one of us. Every one of us. None of us have an excuse. We're all sent. And we mentioned this last time. We got a lot of laugh. We're all witnesses. Problem is, a lot of, wit a lot of us are witnesses for the prosecution. <laughs> Do you know that most Christians are not Christians because of Christians? <laughs> say that again? Oh, you want to hear that again? I yeah, like to say yeah, it again. That? I like to say it again. Because I love, but it's true. You talk to people. They have so many people in their life they've seen that, that have hurt them. Uh. Most Christians who are not Christians because of Christians. We've got to change that. When he said, go, the, the two things you're supposed to do, right? Love him and love your neighbor as yourself. Yes. And he says, if you do those two things, you satisfy everything. Well, that's pretty good. You mean I only, are you telling me I only have to handle two commandments and it satisfies all? That's pretty, is, is that true? Yeah, Jesus said it was true. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, why is that? Well, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you, you love them, you, you're as concerned for their salvation, their salvation that's as you it. are your own, okay? That changes everything. That means everything I do is leading them closer or further away from God. So all of a sudden, it's not a matter of legalism. No. It has nothing to do with it. Never. I want to get people around me <laughs> to get saved. 
And so my language, what I laugh at, what I look at, what I indulge in, I can do all those things to get to heaven. But if I want to get other people to heaven, I need to start cleaning up my acts and representing the Lord. And, and there's joy in that. There's freedom in that. It's not bondage. It's just freedom. <laughs> Boy, you know what? You just jarred my memory last Sunday, and I, I, I just asked for forgiveness in advance if this person's watching or is here right now. I, a woman came up to me last Sunday in tears, very, very distraught over the fact that her father, elderly father, is at home, hospice, and dying. And she said, I am concerned for his soul, and I don't know what to do. And I've never met her before, and I don't know her, but I asked her, do you know the gospel? Do you know Christ yourself? And there was a hesitation, which is, which is not exactly normal in a way, if I'm reading this right. She's concerned for his soul, but either A, she's not concerned enough for her own soul. <laughs> That's probably not the case. It's probably that she's not been taught right or doesn't know. Here's the sad thing. Her dad's dying. She doesn't know exactly where her footing is with God. So she doesn't know what to say to her dad. In other words, you don't want to go around saying something. You want to be used by God to speak to somebody because you've got something to say. And so we wound up getting her some, some immediate help. But the point is, in that conversation, I I asked her straight up, have you, have you told him, have you given him the gospel? And she said, no, I have not because I'm afraid of what he might think about me. And I said, you do know he's dying. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I was serious. That was, wow. it, you do know he is dying. <clears throat> so why would you care what he thinks mm. about you? Mm. This is not the point. If he's dying, he's not going to think those thoughts. If he's, if he's desperate, which is a good place to be, friends, if you're dying and you're not desperate, look, if you're, if you're a Christian and you're dying, you're not going to be desperate. You're going to be like, let's go. Seriously. <clears throat> but if you're not a Christian, when that, when that time of death is approaching, you're going to be desperate. And so this, this was a painful reminder that you just jarred my memory about where she could have been loving all over him with the truth. If he, re, if he accepted the truth or not, that's not our mission. Our mission is to love and to share. And wouldn't it be amazing if just, look, he, the Lord used 12 people to... Well, I mean, 11. And then he, <laughs> then he picked up Paul, so 12, to change the world forever. And there's more than 12 right here right now. If tonight, could you imagine if, if this night, tonight, before we ended <clears throat> this evening, that we prayed for you to receive the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be the catapult for you to, to clearly be Bold just to go love. Barry said, uh, would you say reckless, recklessly? Go rec what'd you say? Or reckless abandon. Reckless you abandonment. Just, you just go for it. Just go for it. And, and if, if, that, if there's fear in that, and a lot, most of you raise your hands, that's Satan. He does not want you to do that. No, no, he doesn't. He does not want you to do that. Don't let him laugh at you. You stop, he's laughing. <laughs> I stopped him again. Don't let Satan laugh at you. No, he's defeated. You, you got work to do. I'd love on people. I, I, I tell you, it's true. Um, I have a, a story, and if, if I, 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 I dare not say this, but I, I, I feel like I should. Um, there's a, a guy named Dave Roberts that was a great car guy, and um, he bantered with me for 20 years about the Lord. He never got serious. He just always had the question. He was kind about it. 
But he liked the, he liked the dialogue. One of the brightest guys I'd ever met. And so we went to dinner with, um, can, I, can I say, Dave Wilhelm, the greatest dentist in the world, David Wilhelm down here. Yeah. And he and Victoria we went, and, and he, Dave wasn't a Christian yet. And he says to me in private, he says, if you want to get to Dave, you better get to him pretty quick, David Robertson. I wow. said, why? He's dying. He has stage four cancer. He told me. Wow. So I called David the next day. I said, can we have lunch? He said, absolutely. And I led him to the Lord. <laughs> he was ready. After 20 years, bam. You know, I've been chumming for 20 years. <laughs> that's, and that's brilliant. I've been sharing. I'll, I'll tell you another right quick. I got a call from a guy, Bill, in, in Chicago. He says, uh, our, our, our friend is dying in, in, in Portland, in, in Oregon. And, and uh, uh, he wants to talk to you. He's on a hospice bed. So I knew what that was about. And it happened I had an off afternoon, and Karen and I were going to go to the movies. So we're heading over to Big Newport. I said, Karen, you drive. I got business to do. So I called him. And I said, what's going on? He's, I'm dying. I said, oh, my goodness, no. I didn't. I let him tell me, you're dying. What, what, do, you, what do you want? I, I need to talk about God. I need, you, you've been, okay. So within 12 minutes, I led him to the Lord, okay. And, and then I had him pray a second time to make sure he renew what he was saying, you know. And I said, do you realize we're going to be in eternity together? He's, what? I said, we're going to spend eternity together. You realize that? Well, he hadn't thought that far. <laughs> he just knew he was dying, and I'd been talking to him. You know, so in 12 minutes, I led him to the Lord. Not actually. It was 50 years. That's right. I've been sharing with him for 50 years, and he gave me no response, nothing. And now he's dying. Now he wants to know. Yeah. So Dave Roberts said, I, I lead Dave the day. He calls me the next day, and he's happy. He's, but I have a problem. I said, what's that? He's, I don't have a, 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 a pastor, anybody to lead my service. Could you lead my service? I said, of course I could. He said, I don't have a church. I said, taken care of. I know right where we do it. He's, would you tell my friends that I accepted Jesus? Oh, I wow. said, absolutely. See, he said, would you give them an opportunity? Would you give them an opportunity to receive? He's asked, he had all these questions all lined up. Absolutely. So awesome. It was amazing. And four hands raised. And one of them was my dentist, David Rohan. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Woo! Oh. You just do it. I, there's so many stories. A wonderful couple of Sunday came to me and said, you know, uh, we got to tell you something right quick. You prayed for a son 14 years ago. I said, where was that? And we had a car show. And we told you he was in trouble. He was offline. And, 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 and we said, would you pray for him? And I said, well, let's pray for him right now. He said, you prayed this incredible prayer for him. And now he's a dad. He's serving the Lord. His kids are, you know, it's like, I mean, you just do it all the time. And you can't begin to keep up with it. It's just, you love on everybody every day <laughs> you know, without hesitation. And it starts building. It just starts building. So it's, it's like, it becomes like breathing. It's just so easy. I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, and, and this is just speculation on my part, but um, God never wastes anything. Nothing. And I think the older you'll get, the more you'll understand that. Where you look back. It's, isn't it amazing to look back? And you learn so much. Boy, I'll never do that again. Or boy, I, I'll do more. I, that worked. I'm going to keep... You know, you learn so much by looking back the right way through the lens of Christ, okay? And he never wastes anything. He's so efficient. And so where you and I are living right here, right now, in this time, what's coming? What is ahead of us? We don't need to be concerned about that. We need to be ready for that. Well, what is it? Barry's been saying it all night. God's gonna, whatever it is, God's going to give us the words. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit's promise to be with us in that moment. But what if you look around this world, there's a lot of, a lot of bad news and a lot of ugly things going on, and the church 
on a general scale, seems to be absent AWOL nationally. I don't know if you know this or not. But nationally, the church is like absent. But what if there's something coming, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit? I don't know. Uh, some issue? I don't know. But what if tonight, because God doesn't waste anything, that you're ready and there's tools that are available for you, and Barry's got some other slides to show you, that you can be so ready that, believe it or not, it's exactly what you and I were supposed to be doing in the very first anyway, and that's loving others with a Christ-like love to where, what if all the electricity goes out? People are going to be knocking on your door asking for a candle. Love them. Well, what if, what if uh, this or that or the other? What, what, it doesn't matter what it is. I believe that whatever, and this is based off of history, whatever is going to happen from here to whenever, based on history, always is the opportunity for the Christian to share their faith. It's always an opportunity for us to help people that are hurting or terrified. It's always the moment for us. There's no, well, I'm going to wait and see. I don't know. Listen, that's not always a good thing for the Christian. Waiting, yes, of course, wait on the Lord. Always wait on the Lord. But when the door opens, you go through it. Like, Lord, use me. I just heard Barry McGuire. That was challenging and, and thrilling. I'm going to do it. And you're driving down the road and, uh, you know, there's, there's somebody with a flat tire. Oh, God, send them, send them someone to help. <laughs> now, I mean, use discernment, but be praying, you know, but, but let's be open. Let's be tomorrow at work. I'm a big fan of this. And I'm, uh, to God be the glory, the, the, to back up what Barry's saying, because it's not, it's not something that he invented. It's something that God and his nature does. I remember, some of you remember the day that Ronald Reagan was shot. Anybody remember that day? I remember that day. I remember exactly where I was at because it was my first day at a job that the whole job, the whole thing, the, the job was terrifying. It was just terrifying to even have been hired for this job. And I was shaking in my boots just to begin with. It was an ori orientation day for this job. And then the news was announced that Ronald Reagan was just shot, President Reagan. And um, it's weird because just an hour before that, I pulled up into this vast parking lot of this global corporation, and I remember saying, Lord, I just ask you to give me your favor, and I'm willing to share with whoever you might bring to me. But you're going to have to bring them to me. And I want you to know, that was a fumbling, terrified prayer that God heard. He heard it. <laughs> and over 13 years of working there, I never once approached one individual to share Christ. And yet, there were people coming to Christ as I shared with them, because here's what happened. During break time and lunch time, they asked me, can you yeah. tell me about Jesus? <laughs> well, you see, Jack, how did that happen? At break time, I would deliberately, I got this, Pastor Chuck Smith was going through the book of Daniel at the time. And he had just taught us the portion of scripture where the decree was given, no one's allowed to pray by uh, King Newsom. <laughs> Ru ruler of Babylon. <clears throat> he said, nobody's, nobody's allowed to pray. And Daniel, Daniel goes home. What does he do? Oh, you know, oh, he did more than that? Exactly. <laughs> he prayed and, actually reverse it, he first opened his windows... <laughs> And prayed towards Jerusalem, and then all of the 
tattletales went back to tell the king what was going on. And Chuck had just taught that. And so I had, I had, in that moment's time, the Lord had just laid it on my heart. It was, wasn't even an original thought. It was from God, I'm sure. A- ask me to have people come to you. So what I did was, is I went and at break time, I would read my Bible either in the cafeteria or outside on the tables. And you, you can do anything you want at break time. And I'd just read my Bible. People saw that. And they're hungry. And they're hungry. I have to tell you, 13 years, not one person ever said, what are you reading, the comics? What is it? Was that a joke book, the Bible? What's wrong with you? I thought you had some brains. What are you working here for if you're a person of faith? Not once. And I was a supervisor of a research lab, and what happened was, My manager came in one day and said, I need to talk to you. All right. So I go to his office. He shuts the door and he said, you and I have to go down to human resources now. That's not a good thing. By the way, human resources. I'm not a fan of human resources. That's that's how Satan gets into a company and ruins it. No one in human resources ever starts a company. (laughs) They just ruin them. Anyway, um... So, you know, oh boy, what's going on? He goes, I don't know what's going on. So I felt really bad because this is the guy that actually hired me. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness. We go down to HR. I've never told you this. We go down to HR and there's about five people in the room. Then they shut the door. So I go from Daniel opening his window to prayer to the lion's den. Human resources and R&D... They tell my manager, Mark Mallinckrodt was his name, they said, uh, we have an issue. And that issue is, uh, people are going to jack during break time because of their broken marriages and their suicide, suicidal feelings and all these life issues. And we're finding out about it after the fact and I said, I'm not, I'm, I didn't say anything to anybody. And they, they said, we, did, we didn't hear it from you. We heard it from them. They said, I was really down. I felt like killing myself. I talked to this guy in R&D. And, uh, and so, wait, who is this person? Well, it turned out to be me sharing the word of love to them during break time. So HR told my manager... When Jack's involved in a study, because we had studies, for those of you, it's a weird thing. When you're involved in a study, you can't walk away from it, because there's things happening. They said to, the, to my manager, when we call you, Mark, you have to let him come immediately to HR. <laughs> and why? Because I cared when people were hurting, because God cared for me when I was hurting, that they bent all the rules (laughs) and that was a relationship at that corporation for 13 years and it was unofficial and yet all the officials knew about it because if people care uh, for other people, other people are going to, they're going to listen to what you have to say. Wow. Wow. And um, yeah. Yeah. So it's a God thing. It is. Um, we're going to run out of time here, and we got you a do, lot of stuff go, that we want to cover I'll, that we would talk go. about. Um, uh, seriously, we have some other tools. Right quick, can we get the slide on the e-prayer? Right quick. This is really cool. Okay. How many of you have ever told somebody you're going to pray for them, and then by the time the evening comes, you forget um, if it was the ankle or the elbow or the aunt, or the cousin. Nobody's ever done that, right? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Here's the problem. When we, when we tell somebody we're going to pray for them, I, I wouldn't so much say it's a vow, but kind of because you're telling them you're going to pray for them. Yeah, it is. And if you don't pray for them and it goes south, they're not blaming you, they're going to blame God. So first off, be careful. Don't just throw it out like, 
<laughs> oh, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. you got to be careful. And, and when you do, open up your Ignite Prayer. It's, it's within our IgniteAmerica.app uh, website, okay? This is, this is amazing. So you take it down. You say, okay, it's your, your elbow, and, and you, you did the information down, okay? So you got it. That goes to your prayer list. At night, you can open There's your whole prayer list. So it's perfect. But more than that, you say to them, uh, what's your email address? Uh, why do you want my email address? Because I want to stay in touch with you. Now, you may be standing in the line at Starbucks. They don't know you. But I get to tell you, when you say, I'm going to pray for you, and I want reports, I want to stay up with you, they'll give it to you. And then guess what? Anytime you want, you hit one button, and it sends them an email. It says, I'm praying for you every day. Would you give me an update? Or you could first slide it. This is Barry. Hey, remember me? Barry McGuire. I met you at, at Starbucks the other day. I'm praying for you every day. And can you give me a little update? What do you think that does for that person? Nobody's praying for them. Totally. Nobody's loving on them. And this person I just met at Starbucks is praying for me every day. Can you imagine the relationships to get started, right? And then ha have you ever said you're going to pray for somebody for their surgery at 10 o'clock on Thursday and thought about it about 2 o'clock Thursday afternoon? Have you? Ever, am I the only one that's ever done that? <laughs> So you put it in there, and a quarter to 10, it, it alerts you. They're going into surgery at 10 o'clock. Is that cool? That's e -prayer. We're going to have to skip through these things pretty quickly. But we have to, every kind of tool you need for sharing your faith is available now at Ignite. This has been coming for a long time, not just since our last, last meeting. But uh, that one's pretty cool. We told you about Seeking God cards. And how many Seeking God cards have we gone through here at the church, Jim? I don't know. Does somebody know? It's in the tens of thousands. Well, you went through 50,000 to begin with. Initially, I, I don't know yeah. what the count is, but it is... It's something in excess of 100,000. You guys have been amazing getting these cards but out. But you get sure. these cards, and what we have here is, instead of Ignite America this side, we have Calvary Chapel. So when you talk to people, carry these with you every day. They're free, okay? Carry them with you. And your job is to get them started. It'd be a spontaneous thing. You probably, you'll never see them again. But rather than just leave them to the wind and you have no way of, of, of encouraging just God bring somebody else into their life, that's what it used to be. We said, we need to have a leave behind and not a tract. So we give them this card seeking out with a QR code. And so every time you talk to somebody spontaneously, then you say to them, it sounds like you're really interested. Would you like to know more about God? They'll always say yes. Say, boy, do I have something for you. This will take you there, and this is a huge site. Do you go on that site? You just you can't believe all the information. This card, this website, would take them from zero knowledge of God to the sinner's prayer. <laughs> it's all on there, seeking God. That's an amazing tool, really an amazing tool. So uh, that one. Let's see what else do we want to talk about, right quick. Okay, got a couple of things. Yeah, go. yeah, you know, fear is the opposite of faith. Just think about this for a second. If you're living in fear, we already talked about it. Yeah, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But look at a little bit further. Uh, without faith, you can't share your faith. Always be ready to give a clear presentation. You can't if you're, not, if you're not living in faith. More importantly, we all want to have our prayers answered, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's the most basic thing. But in James 1, he says, without faith, if you're living in fear, you're without faith. Okay? We're people of faith. We're believers. And we're living in fear. You realize it's the, this is where the church is today. The church has gone silent. We're sitting there worrying about stuff we can't even change. And all the stuff we can change, we're not paying attention to. We're so wrapped up in fear. It's, it's all convoluted. The fact of the matter is, when you're praying and you're worrying at the same time, you're double-minded. And in James 1, he says, you're unstable in all your ways. Don't expect to receive anything from me. So there's a lot of you here tonight that are praying about serious issues in your life and you're not hearing your prayers being answered. It's not because you're not praying, it's because you're praying and worrying at the same time. Mm. You have to get the wholehearted faith. Wholehearted faith, it's not, I did it. clearly done it. When you lived as long as us, we've done it the wrong way. We just talk about the right way, but we did this the wrong way a lot. 98% faith doesn't work. You still have 2% of fear. It has to be a wholehearted, wholehearted faith. So heart of faith, then he answers your prayers. You want God to direct your steps, right? Every day now, you need to direct, just to keep you out of trouble. You don't know what's going to happen around the corner. You need to direct your steps. Guess what? You have to have wholehearted faith. 
Trust the Lord with your whole heart, right? And I'll direct your steps. It's wholehearted faith. So this, when we're not telling people to share their faith, we're robbing them of having wholehearted faith. We're robbing them of having their prayers answered. We're robbing them of having their steps directed. Do you follow how this all works together? This, this whole subject of evangelism and sharing faith is so caught up in learning this and four points and all that and, and, and memorization and finding one person instead of just living your life. Just love on people and let people, let God love people through you. When he's loving you, he's salvationing you. That's what his love is. It's all about taking us to heaven. God's salvationing you with his love. When you love on others, your salvation, really, it's God salvationing them through you. There's, there's nothing secular. Every conversation you have, God is loving people through you and bringing them to him. It's supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit working. This is not going through life and just forgetting about it. It's everything we have is secular, folks. Every moment of every day, you never know what the next opportunity is. And you touch somebody, and it changed their life forever because I was focused. I was looking. I'm looking for conversation. you follow what I'm saying? It's a full-time job. We can't just say it's okay and then go on, and I did it. Yeah, I did You know, two weeks ago, I had a great conversation. I hear that sometimes. No, this is every conversation, every day. you got to be all in. Spurgeon has a great quote on that about it. If he's a part-time God, he's not a God. Yeah, you know, that's true. He can't be part-time. Either all in or you're not. We're talking about being all in. So you, you follow that. Well, of course. And, and uh, finally, how do you get to that place of wholehearted faith? The by, byline of this book, if you haven't read it yet, is defeat fear with effortless faith. Defeat fear with effortless faith. Because when you live for his purpose, right? You live for his purpose, Romans 8 says it very well. Romans 8, 28, we've all heard it, but we haven't paid attention to it. We mentioned this strongly the last time. He says, when you love me and love your neighbors yourself, when you love me and you live for my purpose to seek and save the lost, when you live to do that every moment of every day, I promise you everything in your life will work together for good. Yeah. Everything. That's his promise to you. Karen and I are living proof of this. I'm living proof of this. Karen's love me. We're married 60 years. Karen, stand up for a minute. This is our testimony. <laughs> and I can tell you, folks, it's, it's not because we're good. It's not because we're smart. It's just because we're following God's principle. We don't have bad days. We have no worries. We have no fears. We have no anger. We have no angst. We, every day is an adventure <laughs> because we've had enough decades of learning that till we finally come to the conclusion it is so much fun living for the Lord every moment of every day. It's just, it's just amazing. And that final one, of course, Isaiah 43, 10, I appointed you as my witness. Think of that. He appointed you as a witness so that you'll believe. Not that you'll believe more. It doesn't say that. He's basically saying, if you want to get full belief, share your faith. Because when you share your faith his way, not reciting stuff, not getting in your own, not having all kinds of nerves about being yourself and, and what you might say, but just with reckless abandon, when you, when you share your faith, you allow me to speak through you to those people. It changes your life and you live in the intimacy with God and you're in it right where the place he wants you to be. And there's nothing better than that. You live in the favor of God. It's just... It's just you can't say enough about it. So do you get the point? It's, it's, it's full time. It's wonderful. It's, and it works. I often say when I'm speaking to people, who knew? The scriptures work. They're actually true. Exactly what they said. We've proven them all. So uh, what, what's our next right quick just to run through? Yeah. Okay. Here's, here's a, you may not have looked at salvation this way before. Okay. And this kind of, he's got you. He doesn't have you. He's got you. He, he doesn't got you. He's got you, okay? <laughs> Just a little, uh, uh, having fun with something that's very serious. First off, he created us for heaven, right? And none be lost. We know that. He created us for heaven. That's why he didn't create us for earth. He created us for heaven, right? None be lost. But then he gave us free choice. He had to give us free choice. Without free choice, there'd be no relationship. We'd be a robot. So he had to give us free choice. But when he gave us free choice, he knew then that most would make the wrong choice. He knew it. 
what's going through God's mind. I'm making, I'm making, it's to have fellowship with me, to be joint heirs with Christ. That's what, that's our promise. But most people will go the other way. It says broad is the destruction. Most will go that way. Narrow is the way and few will find it. We're there. We're finding it. We've got it. Okay. So we're in that group. Okay. So when you do that, that's why the angels rejoice. Understand, we're speculating how many people, what percentage of the world's population are saved. In the United States, it may be 10%, maybe less. Did you hear me? The polls say 70%, 60%. Everybody says they're Christian. You know evangelicals, you look at what evangelicals believe today, they don't even even believe you have to be saved anymore. It doesn't even make any sense anymore. About 10%. So do you realize, from God's perspective, if we have 7 billion people, that's 700 million people, but that's 6 billion, 300 million people that are being lost. You want to know why the angels rejoice when we accept Jesus Christ? Mm. They're so excited. We got one. Yeah. We got one. We got another one for eternity. Hallelujah. There's, re- there's rejoicing in heaven, right? And so, there is, so he's got us back, okay? And new Christians, they tell people about Jesus. It's all wonderful. But then this happens where Jesus says, you've left your first love. You, you're here, good teaching. You're giving sacrifice. You're in church. He's speaking to us, church. But you've left your first love. You're caught up in something else. You've made something else more, than, more important than me. And, and that could be a boyfriend or a wife or grandkids or whatever, or it could be a, a, a very important cause, p- p- fighting abortion. You could spend your whole life fighting against abortion and not get one person to heaven. Maybe not even yourself. We could take these issues that we, in this church, Jack, the way you run this church, and we touch it, all these things, but they're not our God. I don't run the church. Okay, I but church, you know. <laughs> but don't you appreciate the fact that we're in all the issues? We're representing God in everything, but there's no question who God is in this church, right? <laughs> Woo. So when, when we get distracted by things, quite frankly, in a lot of, in the, more times than not, we get hit by it because they want our money, okay? And we listen to their stories, and there's a tinge of anger in almost all of them. They're fighting for this cause. They're really saying, God, come help me with my God. And their joy and their, their, their prayers, everything tied up in this. And we lost that in Kentucky. We've got to get more people. We need more money. You go to support this. And they get so caught up in these issues. We need to support all those things. Don't hear me wrongly. We need to support those. But the fact of it is, when you make anything your God other than God, you're in trouble. Okay? And what happens is you start opposing the people on the other side of those issues to the point where you can get angry, if not hating them. And God loves them as much as he loves us. That's right. All the stupid stuff's going on because they're lost. Satan's blinded their eyes. You understand, 90% of, a country, of our country, they're lost. Yeah. They're lost. For eternity, they're lost. Satan has blinded their eyes. Jesus said it. They see evil for good and good for evil. That's why they actually believe this lunacy is good. And guess what? We would too. That's right. If we weren't saved. We'd if we that. weren't saved, we could easily be there. I remember we were watching the riots back in the day. And there's a young guy jumping on top of a burning police car. And he was raising his hand. And smoke was coming on my I was so furious. And in the middle of that, God touched me. That could be you. Yeah. What? I was raised in the church. To whom much is given, much is required. If I was raised in the streets like that guy, I'm a pretty aggressive guy. That could easily be me jumping on top of that police car. They're lost. Yeah. We have to stop hating people. We hate the sin. We love the people. We need to love people into heaven, folks. We've got to get busy and start loving everybody and doing with everybody every day, every moment of the day. When we do that, the blessings in our lives overflow and you have you just, I mean, it's the best of all. That's what life on earth as a Christian is intended to be. <laughs> so let's see, if we have one more, I don't know if we have one more or not. Oh, this is pretty interesting. Yeah, this is pretty sobering. 
Do you know why people don't share their faith? There's a long list. I'm not qualified. I don't have the time. You know, I, I can't answer the tough questions. I don't have the personality. He didn't say go into the world, all you have a certain personality or whatever. He just says, all, all you go. But somehow we, we, we get to the point where we, we just don't care. Pendulette told it, well, if, if, if you knew I was going to hell, how much would you have to hate me and not tell me? We all have friends that are they're lost and we're afraid of offending them. Well, don't offend them, love on them. Never offend them. Don't tell you're going to hell. <laughs> Just love and love to see love. Love to see Jesus through you. And it may not be you, but pray and, and just, you know, other people could come into their lives. But the point of the factor is that is our number one goal. We ha- we're here now, and only God knows where the end is. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. What do you think God's number one goal is between now and when the rapture happens right now? What, any idea? Yeah. How do we get as many people into heaven as possible? That dwarfs everything else. The founder of the Salvation Army said, I would like it. I got this for you. You gave this in a sermon a couple of Sundays ago. I would send Christians to hell for five minutes. If you, can read, if you read the scriptures on hell, they'll scare the hell out of you. <laughs> Seriously, and we don't do that anymore. Do you know the gospel? The gospel is heaven and hell. We have it inside of us. We understand what good and evil is we understand what rewards and punishments are we know that the baby knows that when they steal the cookie they know they're in trouble (laughs) it's innate in us you know why because god wanted that way so god overachieves in everything he overachieved in heaven but there's just as many scriptures telling how he overachieved in hell and there's the two you have a choice but we stop talking about hell it's almost non-existent most evangelicals don't believe there's a hell anymore what on earth? We just, we've, we've taken half the gospel away. Mm-hmm. When you explain to people, and he say, if, if, if Christians had said five minutes to see hell, yeah. you'd be thinking of everybody you're talking to differently. Yes. And it's forever. Yes. The most horrible part of, of hell is it's eternal. It's forever. We were talking about, if you put me in a dark room, No demons, no fire, no heat, no screaming. Just in the dark room, and I'm going to be there forever. A billion years from now, I'm going to be there with my thoughts. I can remember how many times I could have accepted the Lord and turned back. Forever, it never ends. The most most horrible part of of hell is it never ends. He'd say, if you see hell, you'd be telling people about Jesus. Then we have Pendulette saying, if you thought I was going to hell, how much would you have to hate me? My gracious. Then the Apostle Paul. We were talking about this before the service. Nobody knew this more than, nobody understood hell more than Paul. (laughs) And what's he say? I'd be willing to be forever cursed. This is God caring for the lost. He said, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if, if it would save them. That's a, that's, a, that's a different world than what we're living in. Mm-hmm. I, I have one quote. I, it wouldn't fit on the screen. so I, <laughs> But I think maybe we could pull it up. Do you have that one from Charles Spurgeon? Do you have a special slide on Charles Spurgeon? Yeah, look at this. Woo! And if you want to get saved again, read a lot of Charles <laughs> Spurgeon, right? I mean, every time I get into this stuff, it's like I'm, I'm a middle midget. I'm a spiritual midget. If sinners be damned. At least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them let them perish with their arms wrapped around their knees and pouring them to stay. Wow. If hell must be filled, let it be filled with the teeth of our exertions and let no one go un, unwarned or unprayed for. That's our world. That's where we live. It's got to be our passion, folks. That's what, that's what life is all about for now until we see Jesus face to face. That's our calling. And when we do that, he'll make everything else work great. <laughs> Karen and I learned this back back in, the, in uh, what, 1976. We realized our business is not our God, it's our pulpit. 
If we stopped worrying about our business, we just started proclaiming the good news and telling people. And the more we talked and shared God, the more he built our business. It was the most crazy thing. He does that. He wants to bless us if we use it for him, but hold our hands lightly. If it goes away, it goes away. We may be in internment camps. Our joy will be the same. If we're in internment camps a couple of years from now, I think we're going to be in heaven. But whatever happens, our joy, I mean, we're going <laughs> to let us loose. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to have the time of our life. So you get the point? That's what life's all about right there. That's it. That's it. You, get, you capture that tonight and have that forever. You look at everybody tomorrow differently. They're lost. We're surrounded by the lost. Start loving them. Move everyone every day closer to Jesus. That's our, that's our calling. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Amen. Amen. We're going to... We're going to pray, and before we do, there's a, I think it's authored by Leonard Ravenhill um, in the book, uh, Sodom Had No Bible. It's, it's a, I don't recommend the book for everybody unless you're pretty grounded in grace and understand your scriptures, but Leonard Ravenhill is a powerful author. He's now in, in heaven, but quite an expert on 19th, 18th and 19th century revivals. And, and in the book, Sodom had no Bible. You can probably figure out what he was talking about, where Sodom was obviously terribly judged. And he points out, it was terribly judged for its sins, but it had no Bible. And his whole point is, the Western world has a Bible. So... How are, we, how are we conducting ourselves any differently than Sodom? And he tells in his writings of an actual event in London when a man by the name of Charlie P, like the vegetable P, Charlie P, had been arrested and charged with murder and found guilty and in those days when you were condemned to hanging you were given two weeks you had two weeks to live the moment that the magistrates condemned you you had two weeks automatic and I, I think this is quite merciful only if Every day, an Anglican priest, minister, would go to his cell, as was the prescription, and read scripture to the condemned. And that happened to him every day. And on the last day, Ravenhill recounts that the minister read out of Peter... And they're referenced hell. And Charlie P. said, excuse me? Can you, read, can you read that again? And so he did. That the ungodly or the unrighteous will inherit hell. And he said, well, you know, I don't believe it. And the Anglican minister said, well, it's, it's in the Bible. And he said, well, obviously it's in the Bible. You just read it. But I, I can't believe it. Because you read that to me. And you read it like it was nothing. And I even had to ask you, what did you just say? About hell? He said, no, no preacher, I can't believe it's real. Because if it was real, you would have read it like that. Mm. And if it were real, mm. I would have traveled across England on hands and knees on broken glass to tell my worst enemy wow. the gospel if hell were real. And Charlie P. was taken out to be hanged. 
Now God is sovereign and we leave that up to him. Charlie P. entered eternity. But that minister had opportunity. And he fumbled. And we don't want to do it at this late hour. So I'm going to ask all of you to stand. Let's stand right now in closing. And I'm going to... I'm just going to tell you the Bible straight up on this. I, I don't want you, your denominationalism to get the best of you. Those of you who are Christians, that is your Christ followers, the Bible says the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You know that? Amen. You're sealed by God, the Spirit of God, until the day of redemption. You're His. Nothing can change that, but what you do with it matters how you finish. So we're going to heaven if you trusted Christ. That's God's work. But how are you arriving? Are you arriving faithful or unfaithful? Are you arriving fruitful or unfruitful? In other words, we're going to go into heaven together. Why not go into heaven like Barry's been talking about, where you have lived the rest of your days recklessly abandoned to the will of God to tell others about Jesus because there is a hell that's worth you and I crawling across America or California on broken glass to tell our worst enemy to escape that place. And that, like all things that are good, right, and just, have got to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that for those of us who have the Spirit of God in us, that we can ask for the Spirit of God to come upon us for power to do exactly what we're talking about. When Barry said, just love on people, the human nature lost and alone cannot love on other people. But the human nature saved and redeemed and being sanctified by the Spirit of God is God loving on other people through us. Tonight's been all about yieldedness to the will of God. Can I add one little poignant point? Yes. There's one line we didn't read that you and I rejoiced about back. I know you're excited about it. Can we pull that slide up for just a minute on, I think it's why people don't share their faith? Yeah, down at the bottom. So what's our reward? What's the end game? We often say, and it's so true, the only thing that will matter when we get to heaven mm. is how many people oh. are in heaven because of our influence. What did you do today that impacted heaven? Or this week? Or this month? We're all busy. You know, we can be busy and all that and lead people to the Lord at the same time. It's not either or. You can just do it in the course of things. I'm selling car wax, but while I'm selling car wax, I'm leading people to Jesus, right? But in the end, the only thing that will matter, when we die, the only thing that will matter is not how many bottles of car wax I sold. Uh, no. The only thing that will matter will be how many people are in heaven because of your influence. That's the end game, and we're almost there. And some of you have, you could say, I've not led one person yet. If you're a normal group, about 90% would say, I haven't done that once yet. Guess what? You've got game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've got game. And it's never been easier than right now because everybody's starving. 80% of the lost, the unchurched, know something's wrong. They know it's supernatural. They're looking for somebody to tell them about God. They're looking for somebody. It's never been easier. The last phrase, and I did all that as prelude to this last verse. This is Paul. This is unbelievable. Paul understood hell as much as anybody. And his love for the lost was as good as anybody's. Here's what he says. He's speaking to the Thessalonians. He's, to the ones that he's led to the Lord. These, these are his kids, Right? And he's saying to them, to the church, what gives us hope and joy? 
What will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before the Lord Jesus when he returns? What's our reward? It's you. It's you. It's you. For eternity, you're going to have people coming up to you and say, I'm here because of your influence. Because you prayed for me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. You prayed for my son. It's your influence. We have influence. We don't need knowledge. We don't need anything. We just need passion for the lost. When we get to heaven, that's our reward. <laughs> that's our joy. It's time for all of us to get busy. I'm just saying, folks, there is payoff. There are rewards in heaven, and they are in the souls of people we lead to Jesus Christ. So just an added exclamation point to what you're, what you're saying. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, you taught us in the Word. You taught us through your Son. Jesus himself said, that if a, a child asks his father for bread or for an egg or for some other blessing, will the father respond in giving them a stone or a scorpion or something harmful? He said, how is it that you humans know to do good concerning the thing? Will not your heavenly father give mm the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to you who ask. Now friends, listen, as we pray in a moment, I'm gonna ask you, the believer tonight has the Holy Spirit in them, you're going to heaven, you're sealed into the day of redemption. Mm -hmm. You will be that crown of rejoicing that Barry just pointed out, that Paul spoke of to, to the Thessalonians. But we're talking about now leaving this building tonight and doing it by the power of God. And so we're asking right now, Jesus said, knock, keep on knocking, seek, keep on seeking. He encouraged us to pursue. And in that very paragraph, he said, and how much more shall your heavenly father give you the spirit, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. who asks? Oh, yeah. So church... Oh, yeah. Maybe perhaps you might lift your hands tonight. You don't have to, but you might be saying tonight as a believer, Lord, I pray tonight that you would baptize me afresh in the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that you'd come upon me and overcome my weaknesses, overcome my fears, overcome so much was mentioned tonight about being held captive by Satan's lies. Lord, we ask you to come upon us by the power of your Spirit to be our empowerment, our dunamis, the dynamite power of God. Lord, for the man or the woman, the boy or the girl tonight who is saying, I want joyful, dynamic, powerful Christianity that matters, a real witness for Jesus. Lord, come upon me. Come upon us, Lord. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Look upon us, Lord. Your word says... That as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Lord, we need you. We need to be your witnesses. You've called us to do that. And you wouldn't have called us to do it if you did not intend to give us the power to do it. It's all of you. And Lord, you could have done this all on your own. But you've invited us to Praise God. enter into the field of God. laborers. Praise God. How is it Thank you, Lord. that Jesus himself said, pray to the Lord of the harvest? The harvest is much and many, but there's few laborers. Well, Lord, please, at least for this place, we don't want to be slothful in laboring for you. So, Father, come upon every believer, every one of your children here tonight, and Lord... We know how this works. They'll not feel goosebumps. They're not going to see visions or pass out or whatever. It's going to be that you manifest your power the moment they exercise faith. That's the way you've always worked. The moment they decide, I am going to step out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to love on that person over there. Your power will be there. 
So, Lord, may we not be shy. Father, we thank you. We thank you for Barry. We thank you for Karen. We thank you, Father God, for this global ministry of theirs. And we pray, Lord, that we would all be ignited by your spirit to tell the world the greatest news that they'll ever hear in time and eternity, in time and memorial, is that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, the King of Kings. And he's the sacrificial lamb and the resurrected redeemer. Mm, hallelujah. And we praise you, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Yeah. Church, you're, you're going to be... Yeah. Sure. You guys, Barry's going to be in the foyer if you'd like to meet him and get a book signed. Uh, but for the rest of you, if you've got children, go get your kids. <laughs> God bless you guys. We'll see you Sunday. God bless you.